All right, we're warmed up. We've got a lot of scriptures to turn to this morning. I need you to be active. I don't want you to pull anything. So I wanted to warm up those forearm, those ligaments, those muscles in your fingers. And I also want you to stay active in your mind. I want you to stay with me, be engaged. I want this to mean something to you. I want you to figure out how to apply these truths from God's Word in your life. So as you turn to our text, Mark chapter 15, as we continue to go verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, we're on the next to the last chapter. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I want to uh, get your mind ready to engage with answering question this morning. One particular question that I've put up on the slides is our main focus and our main application as this is a, a question we find in our text today from Pontius Pilate. We're all going to answer that and we're going to look at some other answers to it from other people. But let's start by just getting our minds warmed up on answering questions. And I'll start with what would you do if you earned a million dollars? Now, notice I didn't say you, you didn't get a uh, million dollars because nothing is free. And the lottery is for those people who are bad at math. Uh, you don't win. Uh, there's a reason why there's so many millions of dollars in the jackpot. You don't win it. But let's say that you were able to earn a million dollars this year. What would you do with it? Uh, maybe you would uh, give a lot to the church. You know, we need to build a bathroom in here. Uh, that way you don't have to walk across the parking lot. So that'd be a good use of some of your money. Uh, maybe you'd pay off your house or buy a house. I don't know. Uh, you'd probably be, be happy to have it. Or maybe you would be sad to have it. You, you remember Proverbs chapter 30. He says, hey, don't give me so much that I'm full and forget you. And so maybe you're the type of person that knows hey, I don't need a lot of money because that wouldn't be good for me. I, I wouldn't live right. I wouldn't follow God. There's different answers. I, I don't know how you're answering that question right now in your mind, but when each of us are given a different situation, there's multiple different answers among us. What if you just found out that you have cancer? What would you do with that news? A lot of you may seek out the best treatment possible in an effort to hopefully eradicate the cancer and continue your life. Some people may not seek any treatment at all and just say, you know what, this, if this is it, this is it. I'm ready for heaven, uh, ready to go be with the Lord, absent from the body. Some of you may deny the reality and, and just put your head in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist. I don't know. Different people answer the question different ways. What if you were elected president? You were in charge. What would you do? Maybe your focus would be on decreasing the national debt. Maybe your focus would be on increasing social programs. Maybe your focus would be on strengthening the military and national defense. I don't know. And I'm not going to ask each of you, but you'd probably all have slightly different answers. And today we're going to see slightly different answers to this question. The question to people what will you do with the king of the Jews? And really, your neighbor's answer to the question doesn't matter. Really, the only answer to the question that matters is your answer, is my answer. Because one day, I'm going to see God face to face, and there will be some sort of interaction that includes this question of, what have I done with the king of the Jews. What have I done with Jesus Christ? What have I done with God's only begotten son? And so now if you're with me in Mark chapter 15, let's read the first 15 verses today and see the different people and how they are reacting to this question, what they are doing with the king of the Jews. Mark 15, starting in verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. Now, pause. Let's remember where we are. We are still on Thursday of Passion Week. We've been in the Passion Week for several weeks here in church service, but obviously a few days 
as we recount the timeline. Remember that last night, the Lord instituted the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper that we still observe today in the church. Remember that after that, he was betrayed by Judas with a kiss. He was taken into custody and brought to the chief priests. And we went through several trials that were at best illegal and out of the ordinary during the middle of the night where they were condemning him. We saw Peter's denial three times, in fact, of Jesus, how he heard the rooster crow and saw God's word fulfilled. And now he is in the custody of the Jewish religious leaders. And it's morning time. So we went through the evening with the supper. We went through the nighttime, the Garden of Gethsemane. In the middle of the morning, when it was still dark, he was captured and brought up. They met with the high priest in the middle of the morning in the window of Circadian Low, but they had a reason to be up in the middle of the night because they hated him so much. And now it's beginning to be daylight on Thursday morning which is halfway through the day of the Jewish calendar because the day started at 6 p.m. the night before for the Jewish Thursday. Okay, now we're back to the verse 1. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. Verse 2, and Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now, at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Verse 13. And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Father, we're thankful for your word. We take it as the holy inspired inerrant truth from you. And we ask that you would be gracious to us this morning, that by your spirit you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the truth of your word, eternal, that it would impact us, that it would change us, that for those who are lost, they would be found. For those who are saved, that they would be sanctified. In Jesus' name, amen. Fifteen verses covers a lot of ground. But it doesn't cover all that's contained in all four Gospels. That's why I had you warm up your hands and fingers this morning because I'm going to be turning back and forth between all four Gospels to try to fill in some of the gaps of what exactly is going on on this Thursday of Passion Week as we have the different interactions with our Lord Jesus on the day He is to be crucified. So, what do people do with the King of the Jews? First, I want you to see in verse 1 of Mark chapter 15, it mentions the chief priests, it mentions the elders, it mentions the scribes, and the whole council. Remember, in our past chapters, we've studied this whole council of religious leaders in the Jewish community, and that council is known as the, starts with an S, Sanhedrin. Okay, so these whole group of religious people have gotten together in condemnation of the Lord Jesus, And they have come to their conclusion the night before that he committed blasphemy, claiming to be God himself, and that he was to be put to death. So they're taking him to Pilate. They want to have him eliminated. I'm going to flip back to Matthew chapter 27 in this same account, and I'm going to read verse 1 where it says, When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to 
death. They wanted to eliminate Jesus. Some people want to eliminate Jesus. They would rather him not exist. If he doesn't exist, I don't have to deal with him. If I don't have to deal with him, I can live my life as I please. And the whole religious Jewish leadership, that was their perspective. Let's get him out of the way. Let's kill him. Let's eliminate him. Ask yourself, is that... Delivered him over to you. <laughs> you see what they're asking here? Pilate is trying to seek justice and do a normal trial. And, and these priests are trying to railroad Jesus. And so they're saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> we don't want you to consider the facts and put him under trial. We've already taken care of that for you. We've already come to the conclusion. We're just telling you he's guilty. You just need to kill him. Oh, goodness. So verse 30, John chapter 18. They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said, verse 31 to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So, you see, Pilate here just trying to excuse him. But he doesn't know the facts. He doesn't know the man. He's saying, if you guys, if you guys have already figured it out, what are you bringing him into me for? Take him and judge him by your own law. I don't want anything to do with him. You figure it out. But then they say, well, we would, but we can't. See, we want to kill him, and we're not allowed to kill him. We could talk about that some, because why are they not allowed to kill him? Um, because it's a, it's a festival day and, and it, it's not allowed. Um, because we look back in Acts and we say they do stone Stephen to death. So they do kill someone for breaking the religious laws. So that could be, um, it could be because they don't want a riot in the street. Because the Romans would, you know, uh, take them and arrest them. And, and they wouldn't be able to succeed in doing that. But we know also that it's prophesied that Jesus was to be crucified on the cross. And that's the Roman way of execution. And so it's necessary to fulfill the scriptures that he be crucified, not stoned to death. So all kinds of things going on in there. We just see that, and when I want to point out, like Pilate, some people just want to excuse him. You, you deal with him. It's none of my business. I don't know him. It doesn't pertain to me. I don't want to know him. Let me flip back to Luke chapter 23. We see the same 
question, as we saw in Mark, where they bring him up and Pilate comes out and they say, you know, this guy is trying to be a king. We see in Luke 23, verse 2, they began to accuse him saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. That's what provoked in verse 3, Pilate to ask him that question. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, you have said so. And then, verse 4 we see, Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. So right away, Pilate's trying to excuse him after the first question. They're bringing up these charges that he wants to be a king like Caesar, a political king, a ruler, a leader of an insurrection to overthrow the Roman government and to establish his kingdom on earth, which is not what he's trying to do, right? And so Pilate quickly sees through the hypocritical charges and the false accusations from the high priest and says, I, I don't see any guilt in this guy. Why, why are you wasting my time? I'm going to excuse him. And you may start to feel good about Pilate at this point because you say, well, if I look at that phrase, excuse him, then I think, yeah, that's, that's good. I, I want people to recognize that there is no evil, there is no corruption, there is no sin, there is no offense that Jesus Christ our Lord has committed. Of course, he's, he's righteous and he's just, and there's nothing to be condemned. So that's, that's good judgment. Well, that's part of the way. That's part of the way. And God requires us to go all the way. You can't just acknowledge that Jesus was a good man that he didn't deserve to go to jail, that he didn't deserve to be killed for crimes he didn't commit. Although that is very true, that is not far enough in terms of what God requires of us to do with the king of the Jews. Some try to eliminate him, some try to excuse him. And then number three, some have evil intent on him. Back to our text in Mark chapter 15, verses 3 through 5. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. The chief priests are all mad about it. And we know they've been mad about it. For several chapters as we've been studying this book, they've been mad at him since the very beginning. Why? Because he's infringing upon their territory, their influence, their power base, their acceptance among the community. He's doing things that they can't do because he's the son of God. And they are mad about it and they want evil towards him. That's why they're bringing up all these charges, anything they can think of. They're fabricating. They're bringing up false witnesses, anything to try to get him in trouble, to eliminate him, to get him out of the way. They have evil intent towards him. And so do many in this world have evil intent towards the Son of God. They want nothing but bad for him. They take his name in vain. They curse him out loud. They are enemies of the king of the Jews. Let's add just a little bit from Luke chapter 23. I'm going back over there to verse 5 where it describes these chief priests and their evil intent. In Luke's words, they were urgent saying, he stirs up the people teaching all throughout Judea, from Galilee, even to this place. So you see their insistence. Later we'll see the, the word vehemently. They're just aggravated and actively and aggressively pursuing evil intent towards the Savior. Let's stay there in Luke chapter 23 for point number four where we see that some people are entertained by him. I'm going to continue reading in Luke chapter 23 Verses 6 through 12. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad 
for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. He wants to be entertained. This guy is notorious. It's been said that he's been doing crazy things, not normal things. Well, boy, I'd buy a ticket to see that show. I'd love to be entertained by this Jesus. This is going to be wonderful. Yeah, bring him on over to my house. I'll invite my family and friends, and we'll have just a big night of entertainment. Back to Luke 23, verse 9. So he, Herod, questioned him at some length, but he, Jesus, made no answer. Verse 10. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Verse 11, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about here in this section. Let me give you a little bit of history with regard to these uh, governors, these rulers, these princes, these political leaders that were flip-flopping back and forth between. Um, back when the Lord Jesus was born, Herod the Great was the ruler of this entire region. He was appointed by the Romans to be in charge politically over this area. He considered himself a Jew. He grew up to the southeast of there. So he considered himself a Jew, but he was put in power by the Romans. So he had maybe one foot on each side. He had several wives. He had a lot of sons. He had five or six wills and kept changing his mind who he wanted to be his successor. In the end, when he died, he had a will saying that his older son, Archelaus, forgive my pronunciation, should be the ruler. But the one prior to that had it divided up amongst some other sons, including Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the fellow we're talking about right now. So he was, you'll hear him called Tetrarch, which is, has to do with four, the number four. The Romans, because they couldn't figure it out, Herod the Great's will, and he was a single ruler over all these regions, they split it up into four provinces. He said, okay, we're going to give the older son Archelaus He's going to be the ruler over Judea. And we're going to give Antipas the, uh, the region of Galilee. That's why you hear Pilate saying, oh, he's in Herod's jurisdiction. So they're both governors of a province appointed by Rome to lead and subject these Hebrew people to the Roman institutions. Now, Pilate, he was born in Italy. So he's a Roman citizen. He's coming in, has nothing to do with it. But Herod has his father who considered himself Jewish. So he's down in Judea because it's the Passover, because it's a Jewish thing. So that's why Herod Antipas is down in Pilate's part of the town. And Pilate didn't necessarily have to send him over to Herod for his jurisdiction, even though Jesus spent a lot of his time in Galilee. Okay, but now he's in Pilate's jurisdiction. So that's why they're br the chief priests are bringing him to his court. And remember, we see at the end that the, those two rulers weren't getting along. So maybe Pilate sees it uh, as a way to send an olive branch to Herod. Say, hey, you know what? We're, we're co-rulers here in this neck of the woods. And maybe we could be better friends because I know you've been interested in this guy. So I'm going to send him over to you. Maybe he sent him over to him because he did again, he didn't want to deal with it, remember? And this guy has a little bit more Jewish history than I do, so maybe Herod Antipas will r rule on it and it'll just clear me of having to deal with the king of the Jews. So there's a lot going on here. Remember Herod, he just wanted to be entertained. He didn't want to worship Jesus. He's just like, hey, I heard you're a pretty cool guy, do some pretty cool things, I'd love to see it, come on over. But he was very disappointed, wasn't he? Because Jesus wasn't going to perform for him. He was asking a question. He's like, I'm not answering you. You're not the king of me. Do, do what you will. And they did. So when they weren't entertained, then Herod and his people, they got mad. They started treating him with contempt, mocking him, put a purple robe on him, making fun of him, and sent him back to Pilate. Ah, what a disappointment. I didn't get my money's worth out of that. I want a refund. This guy's not all that in a bag of chips. He wasn't entertained. 
some people want to be entertained with religion. Some people want to be entertained by Jesus. Some people want to go to a church where the pastor's charismatic and entertaining and tells a lot of cool stories and just, wasn't that just fun? We just had a good, fun time with Jesus. Uh, and they just want to be entertained. I would encourage you that Jesus is not here for our entertainment. Okay, let's find our way back to no, let's stay in Luke 23. I'm trying as best I can to piece together the timeline of how all these things are happening verse by verse and we're having to flip back and forth. Okay, so you're still with me. And let's look at Pilate again from Luke's account, still in chapter 23 of Luke. And now we're in verse 13 as we see point five back to excuse him again. So we got the same guy, Pilate, but now we're going to see a second attempt for Pilate to excuse him again. So one more slide there, Jonathan. Point number five, we're going to see excuse him again. Luke chapter 23, I'm at verse 13. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people and after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Verse 15, neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I'll therefore punish and release him. So Pilate is trying as hard as he can to excuse him. And now he's got another ally in his cause to say, look, I even sent him to, to one of your Jewish relatives up the road who's in town for the Passover. He examined him. He listened to your charges and he didn't find anything. He sent him back innocent as well. He mocked him, yeah, he, and he was mad because he wasn't entertained, but he didn't send back any charge of condemnation. You guys are making stuff up. Let's just excuse him. Let's just let him be on his way. Look, I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what he's all about. And quite frankly, I don't care. Let's just excuse him. Let's just, can't we just all get along? If he wants to say he's the son of God, let him. That's not going to affect me. I'm just going to go about my business. Some people just want to let live and let live. Okay, that's fine. You believe what you believe about the Bible. You believe what you believe about Jesus. That's fine. That has nothing to do with me. Just let him go. You, now, Pilate is, is feeling a, some pressure from the priest, right? He says, well, okay, how, how about if I, I punish him and then release him? I can tell you're all mad about it, so uh, how about I, I give him some, some whips and some stripes and we we'll call it good. And, and you guys get back about your business. I'm tired of dealing with this. Uh, let's move on to the next thing. So he tries to excuse him again. All right, let's go back to Mark 15. Back to Mark 15, we're now in verse 6, for point 6, where we see some people envy him. I'm going to read verses 6 through 11. Now, at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner, he being Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea. Release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. Who's that? The Jewish people. Verse 7. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, so this is Pilate talking now to the crowd. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Verse 10, we, we see why, why he asked them that question. It says, verse 10, For he perceived, that is, Pilate perceived, that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up, had delivered Jesus up. So the chief priests were envious of Jesus. Again, he was drawing the crowds. People were, were going to his service instead of their service. It's a competition. And our offerings are going down. We need more money. We don't like what this guy's doing. And Pilate can see right through it. He's just a Roman citizen. He's not a religious man. He doesn't care. He can see the conflict going on. He's like, oh, I get it. You guys are tired of having competition. That's why you're wanting to eliminate him. Back to verse 1. 
And so he asked the crowd. He's like, okay, you're the religious leaders. You're the ones who brought Jesus up here. I'll ask the crowd, hey, you want me to release the king of the Jews? Because we all know he's here on trumped up charges. There's nothing to go against the guy. He's no harm to society. If this is a safe bet for me, I'll just release Jesus. After all, this other option, Barabbas, he's a bad dude, right? He's an insurrectionist, which means what? He was trying to politically overthrow Rome. That's not good for Pilate. Rome is his boss. He doesn't want people like that running around the streets. He was a robber, we find out also. And he was a murderer. He killed someone in his attempt to overthrow the Roman government. That's why he's in jail. You think Pilate wants him back out on the street? No. And for that matter, why would anyone want this kind of guy back in the neighborhood? Well... I can't think of a reason except for, man, they're mad about it. And their envy is driving them to evil intent and the desire to eliminate this king of the Jews. The chief priests are hot about it. All right? Some people do that. Some people are mad at Jesus. Some people are bothered by the fact that he gets the attention that he gets. And that stirs them up to want to degradate him, to badmouth him, to do anything evil they can against him. People are like that. We should not be. All right, now we're point seven. Some people want to exclude him. For this section in, in the timeline, I've got to flip back to Matthew 27, where we see and are introduced to in one verse... Pontius Pilate's wife. Remember what she had to say at the matter. Matthew 27, 19. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, that's Pilate, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. So, Pilate's wife had a dream I don't know, sounds like a nightmare because she said she suffered much. You may think she's on the right track because she did acknowledge that he was a righteous man. So again, that's, that's part way there. He is a righteous man. There was no fault in him. She's relaying that message to her husband, Pilate, but he's really already come to that conclusion, hadn't he? He's already told him, I find no fault in him. I find no guilt in him. Twice already we've seen him try to excuse him. So, I mean... His input coming from his wonderful wife, which I always appreciate. I'm sure he appreciated and it bolstered his internal case because he's like, yeah, this is what I'm thinking too. Why did she have the dream? I don't know. Could it have been divine? Absolutely. Because it have been the anchovies on the pizza the night before? Could have been that also. I don't know. Can't explain dreams, but nevertheless, she had it. She was right in her declaration that he was righteous. But she didn't go far enough. She said have nothing to do with him. She just wanted to exclude him. And so many people just want to exclude Jesus. Just exclude him. I, I don't want to hear about it. I got no time for the God thing. That may be good for you. That's fine for the chief priest. If they want to be all hot and heavy about it, let them be. I don't care. Let's you and I, Pontius, Pilate, let's live our lives out on the beach under the palm trees drinking coconut water and, and let these religious people do with what they want to do. Let's not get wrapped up in these religious affairs. Religion is, is a crutch for weak people. Let the weak people, you know, figure out what they're going to do with the king of the Jews. But let's us, Roman citizens and, and rulers, and let's not even deal with it. Just, just exclude him. Just get him out of the picture. Well... You know, that's not the right answer either. We can't just exclude the king of the Jews. All right. What are we up to? Number eight? Hands worn out yet? I hope you're keeping notes. I studied a lot for this. All right. Maybe you got a photographic memory. You just remember it all. Number eight. Excuse him a third time. So, where am I at for this? I'm back to Mark chapter 15. And I have made it all the way down to verse 12. And Pilate again said to them, 
then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And that's the question of the day. That's the title of the sermon. This is when he asked it in verse 12 to the chief priests, to the crowd. And they cried out again, verse 13, crucify him. Verse 14, and Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? This is the third time Pilate is trying to excuse him. I don't get it. I don't see your case. You haven't explained. You haven't put forth facts that convince me that this man should have capital punishment, that he should be crucified under my political authority as an insurrectionist, one who's trying to revolt against Rome. Look over in Mark, uh, Luke 23. Let's have his account of this version, of this part of the timeline. Verse 20. In Luke 23, we're up to verse 20. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. Okay? He wanted to do what he's been trying to do since the beginning. He wanted to do what his wife encouraged him to do. He wanted to release him because he didn't find any guilt in him. Verse 22, Luke 23. A third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. All right, John chapter 19. This same explanation, the third time Pontius Pilate trying to release him, trying to excuse him. John 19, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Okay, they're just mocking him. Verse 4, Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Verse 5, so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, behold the man. There's a lot that you can take out of that phrase. Verse 6, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Who? All right, now we have another little insight into his thinking process. He's also motivated by a little bit of fear. Look, Romans chapter 1 tells us that there is no such thing as an atheist or an agnostic. Only liars. Romans chapter 1 tells me that everyone knows because the creation makes it evident who God is. Now you can deny it, you can suppress it, you can harden your hearts to the point where you're able to sleep at night because you convince yourself, okay, there's no God, there's no God, there's no God, there's no God, I gotta go to sleep, there's no God. I'm not gonna be accountable for what I do, it doesn't matter what I do, it's all dust, whatever, there's no God, there's no God, there's no God. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to me when you tell me you think there's no God because not because I know you, not because I know your heart and your thoughts, not because I know things you don't know. I just read the Word of God, and the Word of God says everyone knows because it's evident there's a God. And so Pilate is like you and me. He's a person, this side of heaven. So he knows there's a God, and all these things are turning around, and he's a little bit afraid that he's talked to Jesus, he's questioned Jesus, he's been marveling at Jesus, he's been amazed at Jesus. He's thinking, whew, what if these things are true? What if, he, what if he really is the son of God? What if he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords? So he was even more afraid. John chapter 19, verse 8. Now we're to verse 9. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? He's frustrated about it. Jesus has put him in a bind and he's personally uncomfortable about how this is going to work out for him and his future. And he is exerting all of his earthly power and political influence on this Jesus who won't answer him. But now he gets an answer in verse 11 of John chapter 19. Jesus answered him and said, You would have no authority over me at all. 
all unless it had been given you from above. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, congratulations on your authority to make the judgment in this case. Who do you think gave you that authority? Book of Daniel chapter 4 talks about how God himself puts men in charge over the kingdoms of men. Sometimes it's believers, sometimes it's, most of the time it's pagans. But who's in charge of the results of the election? Always God. You go to the polls, you vote, you pray, you work, you do, but know that at the end, the person who is in charge and ruling and given the authority to exercise judgment in the government is ultimately there because God put them there. All right? Know that, be comforted by that. Jesus is, is saying, <laughs> poor governor, you think you're somebody, don't you? Remember, we are never anybody in the presence of the king of the Jews, the king of glory. <laughs> he alone is royalty. He alone has authority to move heaven and earth. He alone created heaven and earth, you and me. So, you cannot excuse him that easily. Pontius Pilate tried a third time there. Well, we're almost done because we're at point nine and we're back to Mark 15. And we're in the last two verses of the day where we look at the crowd. And what did they want to do? They wanted to execute him. They wanted to execute him starting in the second half of verse 14. But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Matthew's account in chapter 27, verse 24 says, So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. He's afraid. Remember, he's appointed by the Romans to keep the peace in Judea. And there's a riot. They're going crazy, which means what? His leadership is failing. He can't keep the people under control. So what's Rome going to do? Replace him. So now he's out of self-preservation and fear of man and people. He's going to capitulate to their cries to execute him. Some people do that. Some people will let the, this righteous man, the king of glory, the king of the Jews, they will let him be crucified and have nothing to do with him because they're afraid of what their neighbor thinks. They're afraid of what their friends think. They're afraid of what their families think. They're afraid of what their employers think. If I acknowledge Jesus to be the son of God, the savior of the world, well then these people are going to riot against me. I'm going to be kicked out of my house. I'm going to be fired from my job. I'm going to be excluded from the family Thanksgiving dinner. What a price to pay. And you think at the moment, ooh, I better keep the governorship of Judea rather than submit to the Son of God. That seems more expedient for me. That seems more beneficial for me. It is not beneficial for you or your neighbor to execute the Son of God. That will not be to your benefit. And what about this crowd that's calling out, execute him, crucify him? Isn't this the same crowd that earlier in the week, they were enamored with Jesus. They were loving him. They were like, oh, this guy is great. I've never heard anybody teach like this. Remember when he came to the simple temple on Sunday evening and he was talking to him on Monday and they were like, yeah, you're cool. And the chief priests, well, they're not. You know, they can go pound sand. But now here it is just a couple days later and they're just so fickle, just flip and flop. Oh, you know what? You're not cool anymore. We like our, our old leaders, the chief priests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We think what they say. We're going to listen to what they're telling us about Jesus. And now we change our minds completely. And we're with them. We'd like to see you crucified and killed. You're, you're a danger to society. You're just a bad, bad person. 
It reminds me of Proverbs 26, 11. It says, they're like a dog returning to his vomit. So is a fool who repeats his folly. They're foolish. They don't take the word of God and do with it what they should, but rather they cry out, crucify him, crucify him. I'm still in Matthew 27, and I'm at verse 25. After Pilate washed his hands, all the people answered, Yeah, his blood be on us and on our children! Exclamation point. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Well, you know what? If you're under point nine where you're calling out, execute him, crucify him, and you want to be named among that bunch, and you want to say, yeah, you know what? We're so confident in our decision. Why don't you just credit our account? His blood? Yeah, just credit me on that, that I was one who sent him to the cross. Okay? All right, we sure will. We'll credit that right to your account, to you and your children, as you pass on that message down your family line that you'll, you're to have nothing to do with Jesus, the King of the Jews. There will be a day of reckoning. And God's wrath will be poured out. God's wrath was poured out. He was crucified, the Lord Jesus, for the sins of the world, for all those who would come to Him, for those that the Father would give Him, the bride of Christ, the Christians, those who by faith are following after this King of the Jews. He took... God's wrath upon him. And so God is satisfied. If you are under the umbrella of the blood of Jesus Christ, then you are forgiven. You're cleansed. No, you're not perfect. But when God sees you, he sees Jesus, the righteous man, Pontius Pilate's wife said. And he sees, okay, payment has been made for sin. His blood was shed on the cross. My justice has been satisfied for these people who fall under the atoning work of the cross of Calvary. But if you're not in that group, if you're in any of these other nine categories of people that want to do something that starts with an E, with Jesus, well, then you got to answer to God. And God's going to say, well, I just see you and your rebellion against me and my wrath is poured out upon sin and so therefore my wrath is going to be poured out upon you and you will pay the consequences of your sin which is going to be eternal damnation separation from God where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and never ever any relief for eternity time without end that will be credited to your account that's the wrath of God that's what we deserve as sinners we say God I don't believe you I should be God. I want to be like God. Let's worship me. Let's make this life all about me. I'm going to live for me. I reject you. I spit in your face. Here's a crown of thorns. Be crucified. Okay, enjoy this life. But there will be a reckoning. There will be an answering. You will be called to the carpet and you will answer to God and explain yourself and it won't be sufficient. And you will suffer God's wrath because you have chosen to abandon the salvation available to you in Christ. Which is my last point, verse 10. The only right response that starts with an E, with what will you do with the king of Jews, is to exalt him. Is to praise him, to worship him, to bow down before him, to submit to him, to repent, to turn from your sins and worshiping yourself, and to worship the one true and holy God. That is the only right answer. Let me tell you what some of the psalmists have said who have gone before us. Chapter 24, verse 8. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Psalm 72, 11. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Psalm 96, verse 9. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Psalm 95, verses 6 through 8. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You may have a hard heart this morning. It may be caused or contributed by some of my imperfections. You may have observed my behavior in Tavernier or Isla Mirada, seen something, heard something, and thought, hmm, 
If that's what Christianity is all about, I don't want anything to do with it. Because that man, Brian Neal, he stands up front and aims to represent God. But he is just as imperfect as me. And you know what? You'd be right. I am just as imperfect as you. I am no better than you. And if you've encountered some other person in your past who named the name of Christ and you saw that they fell short, just like all these other characters we came across, doing things that are foolish, unwise, and that in hindsight is 2020, why would someone ever do that? I don't know. I can't explain it. I, I can't tell you why they would. But you base your decision upon another person as to why you're not going to respond to Jesus Christ the way he deserves, I would encourage you, you are making a grave, eternal mistake. If you answer that question, what shall I do with the king of Jews on any other basis than what God tells you through his holy, perfect, infallible word? This is the truth. I am not perfect, but this is. God does love you. And despite the fact that even those that God does love, even though Christians this side of heaven are not perfect and they still do stupid things. There is still remaining sin in all of us that we have to repent of, that we have to turn from, that we need God's grace to overcome. That we have habits that bring us down that we continue to go back to like a dog returning to his vomit. God, forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help me to do right. I want to do right. Base your decision upon the facts that you find in God's word. And I beg you, be reconciled to God through his son, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't eliminate him. Don't excuse him. Don't have evil intent against him. Don't be entertained by him. Don't envy him. Don't exclude him. Don't execute him. Exalt him. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the glorious good news of the gospel. Thank you that there is forgiveness in one name alone, the Lord Jesus Thank you that no matter what our past is, you are able to...